Warning. The podcast you are about to hear contains coarse language and tells stories of witches. Email us at missingwitches at gmail.com if you want to be heard. And blessed be. We really wanted to dedicate an episode of this, our Missing Witches podcast, to one of those groundbreaking powerhouse 70s witches. Those take back the night witches who were influencing our moms and stepmoms and weird aunts without us even knowing. And we wanted to try to do justice to that young emergent Wicca rebirth scene. But we also had this sense that there was a lot of bullshit in the new age stuff that emerged at that time. And we felt like we hadn't quite found a perfect entry point. That is until we stumbled on the art, research, writing, and fierce activism of Monica Show. You aren't being a proper woman, therefore you must be a witch. You must be a witch. Artist, activist, feminist, witch, Monica Show's greatest work is in her paintings. Women channeled from the unknown country. Goddesses, ancestors, cosmic mothers... She co-authored an overwhelming goddess history called The Great Cosmic Mother. She walked through live munitions testing from Silbury Mound to Stonehenge, had her iconic paintings threatened with gross indecency charges, and as The Guardian wrote in their loving obituary, she and others from End Patriarchy Now interrupted a Bristol cathedral service to demonstrate against the non-recognition of female spirituality by the Church of England, and the dean joined hands with them to sing to the goddess in front of the altar. Turns out that last bit may be some wishful historicizing, as it doesn't play out quite so satisfyingly in her own telling of what went down that day. Nevertheless, we knew we'd found the feminist, activist, artist, witch we'd been looking for. In the wake of life-shattering sickness and death, Sho ventured deeply into the world of 1970s and 80s New Age. And in response to what she found there, she wrote a fucking scathing takedown. <laughs> under the title New Age and Armageddon. She wrote of its gatekeeping, patriarchy, and earth betrayal, and of the reckless appropriation of indigenous spiritualities by the New Age movement that still resonates and shakes you when you read it today. At least it shook me. I read Cosmic Mother and shows New Age and Armageddon while I traveled across Canada, seven months pregnant, camping in national parks and forest reserves and at folk festivals. This is not my norm. I work in tech and media and produce events, but this was my hippie baby moon, and Monica's show was a fierce and loving and ideal companion. Monica's show grew up in Sweden. Her father was a minor painter who seems to have left her with an inherited instinct for direct, uncluttered, raw folk Nordic art, as well as a revulsion for the way the male gaze and sneaking hands can violate a woman's experience of loving art and making art or earning a little necessary money by being painted as an artist's muse. Her mother was a wonderful painter, but as Sho said, her father would turn her mother's paintings to face the wall. Her mother and father separated, and Sho was on her own by the age of 17 with 20 pounds in her pocket. She worked as an artist model in Paris and Rome, traveled around Europe, paid her way by experiencing, in her words, being seen as the ultimate object. She says her feminism originated in the experience of having her second son in her home. She had a home birth after a highly medicalized and stressful hospital birth, and about seven years before the great godmother of the home birth movement in the States would publish the book most cited on the topic today, Ina Mae Gaskin's Spiritual Midwifery. Spiritual Midwifery, published in 1975, asserts that birth can be euphoric and an experience of a uniquely female power. Sho expressed this on canvas. She writes, The painting was based on the natural home birth of my second son, Toivo, in 1961, a birth that I experienced as a first initiation to the Great Mother, who is both imminent and transcendent, both dark and light. For the first time, I experienced the enormous power of my woman's body, both painful and cosmic. And I saw in my mind's eye great luminous masses of blackness and masses of radiant light coming and going. The goddess of the universe in her pure energy body. This birth changed my life and set me questioning the patriarchal culture we live in and its religions that deny the life-creating powers of the mothers and of the greater mother. In ancient matrifocal cultures during the Neolithic, 
women gave birth in the sacred precincts of the great goddess, where they were attended by shaman priestesses who were midwives, herbal healers, and astrologers. Birth was a sacrament, and Vicky Noble once wrote that the original shaman is the birthing woman, as she flies between the worlds, bringing the spirits of the ancestors back into this realm, risking their own lives whilst doing so. We are spirit embodied. I had given birth to my first son in a hospital in Stockholm, and it had been a disaster for both of us. This home birth, without medical and technical interventions, opened me up to the powers of the Great Mother. In all patriarchies, women are desacralized and diminished, and medicine and religion have been taken over by men who envy women's creative sexual powers. I wanted to create a painting that would express my emerging religious belief in the Great Mother as the matrix of cosmic creation. I didn't want her to be a white woman. As a result of this work, I was nearly taken to court and my painting was censured many times during the 70s and 80s. It was considered ugly, obscene, and blasphemous. A modern day witch hunt was carried out against me and my work, and it was racist also. I didn't know at the time I did the painting that the entire human race is thought to have originated from one or a handful of African women in the mists of time. This has been traced through the mitochondrial DNA, which is only carried through the mothers and women. In 1968, there was also no women's arts movement or a goddess movement, and I felt totally alone. I had a sense, though, that ancient women, who coincide with us in another time-space, were communicating with and through me. I was their medium and gateway into this world. Show's descriptions and paintings of her own experience predate the modern midwife movement and the goddess movement and much of second wave feminism. By 1968, her painting God Giving Birth, which came from her own experience of connecting with the living web of women stretching back hundreds of millions of generations who have nurtured life from the dark and with great labor brought the next link forward, her powerful visual expression of that viscerally learned new knowledge was exhibited and by 1970 censored. The mayor of St. Ives objected to the painting and ordered it to be removed on the grounds that it was blasphemous. God giving birth and some other of my paintings were censured and not allowed to be shown anywhere in the town. It caused a scandal and I was traumatized. I was breastfeeding at the time and felt vulnerable. Show's friends will know much better than we can, poring over her paintings and essays and books, but looking at them from this distance, I wonder if she ever did find a safe place to land. Besides, that is, that liminal place she gave us and crucially gave herself in her paintings. In her paintings, she became a spiritual conduit. She magically brought into being this woman, these women who had been before. The paintings are beautiful. We'll post several on our Missing Witches Instagram this week so you can see. They are sometimes stark with hard whites and blues like stones, cairns, great birds at night the gray scale of a world lit by the moon. They most often depict women, often many races together, with a gentleness and strength and an iconic simplicity like they are carvings or etchings or essential outlines just on the edge of your eyes. Just a sketch in time, keeping the lonely painter company. Maybe the loneliness is something I only imagine I hear in her writing and see in her work. After all, she had no lack of collaborators. By 1976, she is in close contact with the editors of Women's Spirit magazine, a lovingly and beautifully produced magazine of feminist spirituality. And she is co-authoring The Great Cosmic Mother with incredibly devoted researcher and writer Barbara Moore, and is reading key early essays in the rising tide of second wave feminism from Sheila Robotham, Mary Daly, Susan Griffith, Adrian Rich, and Andrea Dworkin. The Guardian described her as a bridge between radical and spiritual feminism and British Wiccans during the 1970s and 1980s. She poked holes and stitched links and repeatedly put her own body on the line against the all-consuming status quo. The Great Cosmic Mother, her research tome of women's spiritual history, is, in our opinion, a must-read for women and witches, trying to put the current witch trend into a context long violated and obscured. Just a couple examples from 500 pages of truth bombs and snatch your breath insights. Just as established religions assume the maleness of God, just as Freud and psychoanalysis assumed the maleness of libido, so have the social sciences, and in particular anthropology, assumed the generic maleness of human evolution. 
both popular and academic anthropological writers have presented us with scenarios of human evolution that feature almost exclusively the adventures and inventions of man the hunter, man the toolmaker, man the territorial marker, and so forth. This despite the known fact that among contemporary and historic hunting and gathering people, as among our remote hunting and gathering ancestors, 75 to 80 percent of the group's subsistence comes from the women's food gathering activities. This despite the known fact that the oldest tools used by contemporary hunters and gatherers and the oldest, most primal tools ever found in ancient sites are women's digging sticks. This, despite worldwide legends that cite women as the first users and domesticators of fire. This, despite the known fact that women were the first potters, the first weavers, the first textile dyers and hide tanners, the first to gather and study medicinal plants, i.e. the first doctors, and on and on. Observing the linguistic interplay between mothers and infants, mothers and children, and among work groups of women, it's easy to speculate on the female contribution to the origin and elaboration of language. That the first time measurements ever made, the first formal calendars were women's lunar markings on painted pebbles and carved sticks is also known. And it is thoroughly known that the only God image ever painted on rock, carved in stone or sculpted in clay from the upper Paleolithic to the middle Neolithic, and that's roughly 30,000 years, was the image of a human female. The threefold goddess of Arabia, Magna Dea, was enshrined in the sacred black stone, the Kaaba at Mecca, where she was served in ancient times by her priestesses. The sacred black stone at Mecca, site of so many pilgrimages, is imprinted with her vulva yoni sign and covered with a black pall called the skirt of Kaaba. The male priests who serve her today are called Beni Sheba, which means the sons of the old woman, i.e. the moon. Present-day Muslim pilgrims to this shrine, the most holy place of all Islam, are probably mostly unaware of the pre-Islamic significance of the Kaaba. They circle the black stone seven times to attain the summit by spiraling around it. Seven is the number of the moon, and the ancients always danced the way in spiral processions to the summits of her earth mounds. Moon shrines and sanctuaries were situated in forests, in caves, and on mountaintops, and by lakes, sacred springs, and wells that were also healing centers. Priestesses guarded the water supplies as well as the sacred fires. This was true even in Roman times, where the priestesses were called Vestal Virgins. Ancient moon priestesses were called virgins, and virgin meant not married, not belonging to a man, a woman who was one in herself. The very word derives from a Latin root meaning strength, force, skill, and was later applied to men, virile. Ishtar, Diana, Astarte, Isis were all called virgin, which did not refer to sexual chastity, sorry about it, <laughs> but sexual independence. And all great culture heroes of the past, mythic or historic, were said to be born of virgin mothers. Marduk, Gilgamesh, Buddha, Osiris, Dionysius, Genghis Khan, Jesus, they were all affirmed as sons of the great mother, of the original one their worldly power deriving from her. When the Hebrews used the word, and in the original Aramaic, it meant maiden or young woman with no connotations of sexual chastity. But later Christian translators could not conceive of the Virgin Mary as a woman of independent sexuality. Needless to say, they distorted the meaning into sexually pure, chaste, never touched. When Joan of Arc with her witch coven associations was called La Pucelle, the maiden, the virgin, the word retained some of its original pagan sense of a strong and independent woman. The moon goddess was worshipped in orgiastic rites, being the divinity of matriarchal women, free to take as many lovers as they choose. Sho's writing and her work is luminous and furious. <laughs> In The Cosmic Mother, and even more so in New Age and Armageddon and subsequent essays, she is howling and raging against the violence done to the earth, to true history, to women's bodies and spirits, and she is furious and activist against the slippery ways she sees patriarchy, not just men, taking what it wants from ancient knowledge to sell it to us all again and keep us docile and afraid. She writes in New Age and Armageddon, channeling originated in California. 
Shirley MacLaine a few years ago held a working seminar on reincarnation and channeling, which sold out at over a hundred pounds a ticket. The actress explained to a thousand people why she had to charge for helping people to find their power within. Because it is karmically unbalanced to do something for nothing, she said. Psychic News feels she has sanitized the supernatural for Americans. Another medium, Mrs. Jay-Z Knight, has been channeling the spirit guide Ramtha, who claims to be 35,000 years old since 1977. She charges people $400 to attend her meetings, and the sale of videotapes and other items brings in millions of dollars each year. She has said, I'm not a guru or someone's savior. This is business. As a result of Ramtha's apocalyptic teachings, rich followers are moving to the Pacific Northwest and building pyramid houses in preparation for catastrophes to come. This is in contrast to the loving service given by ordinary spiritualist healers and mediums in Britain who only ask for voluntary contributions and who believe that their powers come through them from the spirit and must not be abused or used for personal gain. It cannot be a coincidence that now, when women are reawakening worldwide and the goddess is speaking through us, along comes the New Age movement with its innumerable male gurus, teachers, masters, shamans, and therapists, telling women yet again who we are, who we should be, and what we are to believe. We are to aspire to Christ consciousness and identify with the sons of light and solar fathers, never mind that to the ancients the sun was most commonly a goddess. We are to act out the feminine principle, popularly called yin, as defined by heterosexual patriarchal men. Many of these self-proclaimed authoritarian and misogynist New Age gurus could be mistaken for reincarnated Old Testament prophets. The rebirthing movement which emerged in California in the 1970s encapsulates many of the most reactionary aspects of the New Age. Rebirthed women, it is claimed, should aspire to become as one with Babaji, an Indian yogi who is seen by rebirthers as the father of the world, a modern Christ, and physically immortal. I find it fearful that all monotheistic patriarchal religions set out systematically to sever our umbilical psychic cord to the body-mind of the Earth Mother or Spider Woman. It is as if they are attempting to tear apart the very web of life. New Age thinking is of such dishonest, smug, self-righteous, and right-wing doublethink paraded as spirituality. New Agers such as rebirthers can then cynically claim that they deserve to be rich and physically immortal. Money flows towards those who have plenty of prosperity consciousness and make the proper affirmations. They don't have to think about living in a world rampant with Western imperialism, that poverty and starvation are on the increase in the third world, and that as Westerners, they are the most privileged people on earth. The New Age movement is, in my opinion, fundamentally flawed because New Age men cannot come to terms with women's real powers or with the goddess who is both of this world and of the other world, both imminent and transcendent and behave as if the women's liberation movement and goddess awareness had come and gone without a trace. In the New Age movement, there is no recognition that women were the creators of the most ancient cultures and that the original mother of humanity and ancestor goddess was African and black. Hers is the luminous darkness that creates life. There is no recognition of women's shamanistic death and rebirth every month when we bleed that women are the guardians of the twilight zones between life and death as we risk our lives giving birth, bringing spirits from the other world womb into the earth plane. Women are always the communicators with the great unknown. We are so because the rhythms of our body minds are in tune with those of the earth, the tides of the oceans in our very beings as we rhythmically menstruate with the moon, the radiant queen of heaven in her changes, the moon, home of the spirits and the maternal giver of mind, knowing intelligence, wisdom, visions, psychic powers, and lucid dreams. She who is both dark and light, anathema to new agers who fear the dark maiden, mother and crone. We are in conversation with the earth all the time. She is after all our mother and there is a silver astral umbilical cord that joins us to her, whether or not we are aware of this. She speaks through our bodies, and what we do to her, we do to ourselves. Within earth, in her internal fires, ores, 
minerals, crystals, and waters, there are mysterious life-giving powers that we no longer understand. I have been writing this book with a great sense of urgency because I know in my very bones that the earth is suffering. And we must now use our second sight, which is our birthright, and be still and listen to what our mother, the earth, is telling us. Here's one secret of why they burn witches. Witchcraft and activism are one. With our acts, words, and rituals, we are summoning a better world. We summon it for ourselves, yes. Personal healing, joy, and fulfillment are one, an important part of honoring the women who came before who brought us this far. Two, how we muster strength to press forward again, to take the knowledge of our luck and strength and beauty with us into the next entanglement for justice. Three, as above, so below. Individual healing from trauma helps set a piece of the pattern of the universe into a new and ancient rhythm of resounding care deviates the drumbeat of trauma on repeat. And this is where self-help new age magic might leave you. But this is only half. This is low tide, a drawing in of breath, a rest, a gathering of strength, a necessary withdrawal. But after low tide comes high tide. As Sho makes so clear over and over again in her writing and research, power and magic come from the earth. She writes, I believe that we are conscious and alive only because she is. Earth is our great planetary mother spirit. We have to fight as well as heal. Turn to the work of resistance and of remaking the world. Add our energy to the waves and together make change. Use our healing to bring about her own, to find and support each other's work to learn about her and each other with the humility and bravery of priestesses and fucking Amazons. Protect the seeds and preserve the grassroots. The Guardian describes Sho as a writer, feminist, formidable networker and activist, eco-witch, anarchist, founder member in 1969 of Bristol Women's Liberation and inspiration behind Amu Mawu, a Bristol women's spirituality group. In the 1980s, with a hundred green and women, she walked across prohibited land to celebrate on the Saracen stones at Stonehenge at the full moon's eclipse. Here is how she describes that act of witchcraft melding with activism. This was the night of Beltane, and we were here to celebrate the mother. We made a Beltane fire carefully so as not to damage the mound, and then gathered to discuss a possible ritual. By now, we had been joined by the American wise woman witch, Starhawk. I shared with the women the vision I had for so long of women reclaiming Silbury as our very own. And for some years, Silbury indeed became a place for a women's yearly unofficial festival at Lamas in August at full moon. Starhawk, an experienced leader of ritual, suggested that we cast a circle, call in the elements, ground ourselves, and dance the spiral dance. We danced and drummed and chanted in great joy. Finally, we slept, curled up close together around the mound like children in our mother's belly or breast. Next morning, the 2nd of May, we gathered around the fire to discuss what to do because the red flags signifying firing in progress within the ranges were up. Starhawk led a grounding meditation to center ourselves and then we took the decision to walk through the fences, irrespective of the firing. Women were facing the barbed wire fences while singing Earth is Our Mother. I had joined them but was overwhelmed with tears and grief at the sight of these beautiful women and the thought of the wasteland of destruction and barrenness that lay in front of us once we had entered the plain. I joined a few women who performed a ritual burying of a goddess figurine in the central fire pit we'd been using. When we went to find the other women, we found to our horror that no one was there, and we were told that the women who had breached the fence and had been rounded up and arrested... The feeling I had was that we were the only three women left on this earth and that it was our responsibility to save her. We ran past the fences and saw to our relief that the women were there, circling and dancing and singing while surrounded by police trying to contain them. We argued with the police who finally realized they would have to arrest every one of us or let us go. Orders came that the firing would cease for that day and that we could carry on. We walked close together and at a slow pace because there were older women as well as mothers with young children. It was also safer. Many women slept that night amongst the stones in the moonlight. Some were arrested. We had been dreaming our land. 
Many pagans and people of the craft have a love for the land and a reverence for the earth. But many, too, do not realize that it is not enough. And we must also take political, direct action against those that ill-treat and exploit her. It was this understanding that fired the women on our walk. At 6 p.m. on the 4th of May, we cut holes through the fences and snaked our way into the stones across the field, all while singing Return to the Mother, while police and tourists look sheepishly on. Our number had by now increased since many women had come from London, Bristol, and other nearby places to join us just for the weekend. Once within Stonehenge, we gave these ancient beings loving care and energies and danced for hours amongst and with the blue stones. We meditated, sang, lit candles, and dreamed. The sky was cloudy most of the afternoon and evening, but around 9 p.m. it cleared, and during a hushed silence we could clearly watch the miraculously eclipsed moon. We stood there entranced on the grass outside the stones, humming and singing softly while she went through her changes. Following the eclipse, a delicate sliver of silver radiance showed itself, and slowly, slowly, she became visible again in her glorious full moon roundedness. This was magic indeed. Towards the end of her life, she dies of cancer at the age of 66, I think, mid-60s. She's still frantically gathering these slides and giving presentations all through Europe, telling the history of the goddess and of women's contributions to science and of the violation to the planet and of indigenous cultures being wiped out. She is this icon for me that we've gone looking for, uh, this origin of a new kind of feminism connected to an ancient kind of spirituality. I think she does this balance. This sense of loneliness is in her paintings and in her work, and she's so committed to communal action that she symbolizes what I want. I want that wave back and forth of together and alone, of gathering strength and then bringing it together. I think our deepest magic is in grasping our duality, listening to our own voice and to each other and to the earth that is all of us. One more story about her acts of direct political action. She tells the story about like dreaming repeatedly of walking into a cathedral and somehow sharing with the people there from the altar the story of the women's holocaust, the story of the hundreds of thousands of women killed in Europe for being healers or accused of witchcraft. And then she makes it happen, and it's this small action that gets rewritten by the Guardian to be even more triumphant than it was, as you'll see in her telling of it. And I think there's magic in that, too. She says, on the 9th of May at 10 a.m., 1993, a group of women taking part in the weekend gathering of Breaking the Silence, Amma Mau in Bristol, did an action in Bristol Cathedral. It was incredibly powerful and magical and felt somehow significant and magnificent. As if we had opened a chink in the ether, allowed some freedom and power for all women to seep through from some other realm, we had broken some shackles in our own minds. I had not been involved in anything quite so empowering with other women since taking part in the Greenham Women Initiated Walk across the firing ranges of Salisbury Plain at the Beltane Full Moon and Lunar Eclipse in 85. That time, we had reclaimed Silbury and Stonehenge and the land there, ancient sacred sites of the goddess for women. I still wasn't sure that I would feel able to take part in, in this cathedral walk, and I woke up Sunday morning at 7 a.m. with a headache and feeling in a state of anxiety. But in the meanwhile, I had made myself a placard with a poster of my painting, God Giving Birth, on its back and front, with the written words, Return of the Goddess, and the beginning of the end of patriarchy, just in case I'd need it. I live presently only a few minutes' walk from the cathedral, and in no way do I want to draw attention to myself in this area or be arrested. But by 10 a.m. I was at College Green by the cathedral, hoping, in a way, that no one would actually turn up. No such luck. Fifteen women or so arrived, and after centering ourselves, making a circle on the green and asking for protection, we walked into the cathedral without any second thoughts. I was scared. So were we all, I'm sure. After all, one doesn't simply interrupt a church service in full swing. We walked in virtually unnoticed, and no one realized what was happening until we were lined up in front of the altar, in the bright lights, and facing the astonished congregation. 
The bishop and his assistants had to stop what they were doing, and he zoomed in on me because, as the oldest of the women, he thought I was the leader. I had placed myself in the center, and I was carrying the placard, and I wanted it to be seen. Considering that during the early 70s, I was several times nearly taken to court for obscenity and blasphemy for God-giving birth, always initiated by right-wing Christians, it was very significant to me that I confronted the bishop with that painting, which I consider sacred, and of the goddess, who gives birth to the universe out of her dark and bleeding womb. He attempted to take it from me and inform me that he was holding a service and that the cathedral is his, at which I answered that the cathedrals are built on ancient sacred sites of the goddess and that we were holding a service of our own. In the meantime, a deaconess asked the bishop whether the police were to be called, but he didn't want a scandal or media at his church. I told him that we wanted to sing a song when he asked me how long we would be there. So there we were, in this great light, Congregation in the darkness, candles burning, men in white frocks, singing all the verses of burning times, very powerfully and accompanied by a few drums. I have an amazing visual image of us there. The butterfly wings painted around Rachel's eyes, fluttering and taking off. Especially when seeing her as we were leaving the cathedral, leaning on the pulpit, declaring the glad tidings of the end of patriarchy to the congregation. We had indeed served notice to the godfather and his henchmen that their time is nigh. As I was leaving an old man, an usher by the door wagged a finger at me and said, You are old enough to know better than this. At which I answered that it was precisely because I am old enough to know better that I was there. Anne Morgan from Glastonbury had been sitting, meanwhile, in the congregation taking notes, and she heard the bishop afterwards saying that we had adopted some decadent Jungian ideas about male and female principles, that we had been a kind of commercial break, and now the service would return to its message of male power and hierarchy. We, however, felt immensely empowered, and like we had broken the sound or mind barrier of some sort. Something had happened on cosmic proportions. When we returned to the conference, women were drumming ecstatically for hours, and we were dancing, dancing, and dancing, dancing, dancing. Start the Diana, Hecate Demeter, Kale, and Nana. Isis is start the Diana, Hecate Demeter, Kale, Yamaya. Isis is start the Diana, Hecate Demeter, Kale, and Nana. Isis is start the Diana, Hecate Demeter, Kale. Yamaya, now the earth is a witch, and the men still burn, stripping her down with mining and the poison of our wars. Still to us, the earth is a healer, a teacher, and a mother. A weaver of the web of life that keeps us all alive. Isis is start the Diana, Hecate Demeter, Kale, and Nana. Isis is start the Diana, Hecate Demeter, Kale, Yamaya. Isis is start the Diana, Hecate Demeter, Kale. Thanks for listening to the Missing Witches podcast and be certain this Wednesday to check out Witches Found, the companion podcast to Missing Witches. This week I'm talking to Phoenix, activist, an artist, a healer, and so, so very much more. So that's Missing Witches Sundays, Witches Found Wednesdays. Be sure to check us out, like, subscribe. Follow us on social media at Missing Witches.